Hi and welcome. This is a supplemental video for chapter one in our textbook. The material that we'll talk about here today is not really covered in depth in the textbook. But some of the ideas, the material that we'll see here is interesting enough that it's worth a little bit of a deeper dive into the material. And of course, if you're a student, because the material is not in the textbook, it probably won't be on an exam. So sit back and enjoy. And what I want to do here is just ask and answer two questions that I often hear from students when they first learn about networking. That is, who uses the internet and who governs the internet? Those are great questions. And as we'll see, as we start to peel back those questions and dive into the answers, we'll see that there are many dimensions to these answers. Of course, there are technological dimensions, but there are also social, policy, and even political dimensions to those answers. So, I think you're going to find this interesting. Let's get started. Perhaps the simplest question we can ask is how many people worldwide use the internet today? Well, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, which is a specialized agency of the United Nations specializing in information communication technologies, estimates there are 7.89 billion people alive on the planet today. And of those 7.89 billion, 5.3 billion, 67% of the population, have mobile phones. And again, of that global population, nearly 5 billion, almost 62% of the population, have internet access. And not surprisingly, this number's been growing over time. So there are nearly 5 billion people connected to the internet today in 2022. In the year 2000, there were 360 million people attached to the internet. That's a growth of a factor of 15 over those intervening 22 years. And as you can see from the bar charts here, the rate of growth has stayed pretty constant over time, over the last 20 years or so. When you first started using the internet, think about when that was. How many people were connected to the internet? When I first started using the internet, the internet didn't literally even exist yet. You may remember earlier when we studied the history of the internet and networking, we learned that a predecessor to the internet was known as ARPANET. When I first connected to the ARPANET in 1980, there were only 200 computers attached to the ARPANET. You know, as grandparents say to the grandchildren, my, how you have grown. Let's now break down this aggregate global number of internet users to look at levels of internet connectivity in different regions around the globe. And we'll see a lot of variation here between areas such as Europe with from 82 to nearly 100% of the population connected, especially in Northern Europe, to 90% in North America, to 72% in South America, and even less in developing regions of Africa and Southeast Asia. And this second graphic shows the number of people in millions that do not have internet connectivity in different regions. There are still 3 billion people not connected to the internet. So there's still a ways to go, and a lot of important work to be done. The statistics that we've just seen are pretty interesting, but they're pretty coarse grained statistics. Do you or do you not have connectivity to the internet or to the mobile telephone network? We can go beyond these coarse grain statistics and ask some very interesting, even deeper questions. For example, we could look into affordability. In 2020, 43 out of 95 countries, that's about half, met the so-called one for two affordability target, a gigabyte of data for 2% or less of the average monthly income. And we could look at gender disparities. In Africa, for example, where internet and mobile access rates are still relatively low, the difference between connectivity between men and women, the gender gap, is 85%. And then we could dive even a little bit deeper into access and discuss what we might call meaningful connectivity, the ability to use the internet every day using an appropriate device with enough data and a fast enough connection. The website a4ai.org, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, cited in the last slide, is a lot of interesting worldwide statistics on internet affordability, meaningful connectivity, and gender gaps across the globe. What I'd like to do next is explore these gaps, sometimes called the digital divide, in more depth here in the United States. Here's some 2021 data from the Pew Research Center about disparities in access to smartphones and to home broadband access in the United States on the basis of age, race, education, income, and urban-rural living. 
And let's focus on broadband access here and note the difference on the basis of income and educational attainment, but also on the basis of urban rural differences and on race. And let's take a look at these latter two aspects of the digital divide in more detail. This graph, also from the Pew Research Center, shows that an urban, suburban, rural digital divide still exists today, but it's narrowed pretty significantly over the last 10 years, when the gap was more than 20 percentage points, to today, when the gap is only around 6 percentage points. This second graph, however, shows that the racial digital divide of around 10 percentage points hasn't narrowed much at all over the past 10 years. So those are pretty sobering statistics about the digital divide here in the United States. So what is the United States doing about closing this digital divide? Well, many of you here in the United States hopefully know that in 2021, Congress passed and the president signed a massive infrastructure and jobs act. It's more than $550 billion allocated to infrastructure investments, to roads, to rails, to transportation systems, airline travel, water systems, and more. And of that $550 billion, more than $65 billion, more than a tenth of it, actually went to broadband infrastructure. Let's take a look at what that means. $45 billion, almost three quarters of that $65 billion investment in broadband is for broadband equity, access, and deployments to expand broadband internet access and deployment to places where it doesn't exist yet. These funds will be administered by the states. There's also an affordable connectivity fund with more than $14 billion to defray the costs of broadband access to help bridge the digital divide that's based on income. And there are provisions for other forms of digital equity, for broadband access for those living on Native American tribal lands, and for rural utilities. Let's wrap up our discussion of who uses the internet around the world with a few statistics on why people use the internet, what are the most popular applications, as well as internet access speeds in different countries around the world. Here's 2021 data from Data Reportal that lists the top dozen or so most frequently cited uses of the internet. And there are probably no surprises here. Finding information, staying in touch with family and friends, keeping up to date with news, events, learning how to do new things, maybe learning about computer networking, and watching TV shows, movies, and videos. All of these were cited as primary uses by 50% or more of the respondents. And I wanted to wrap up our statistics here by showing you some data about access rates, specifically mobile download access rates around the world. And you can see here that these mobile access download rates range from a high of 177 megabits per second in the UAE on downwards. And remember, that's mobile download rates. Here in the United States, according to the survey, the average mobile download rate is 67 megabits per second. Well, as you can see, here in the United States, we're far from number one as a country in terms of average internet access rates. And I'm curious, I live in Western Massachusetts, a pretty small town. What are the average, what are the access rates that I actually see for my internet access? I've got my laptop here and I've got my mobile phone. Let's take a look. Let's start by looking at the maximum download and upload rates between my laptop to a Comcast server in Boston. I'm doing this from my home in Western Massachusetts, connected to Comcast's Xfinity cable network. So the speed test packets are never actually going to leave the Comcast network. My laptop's on my home network, which is attached directly to the Comcast network. So it's all Comcast from my house to the Comcast server. No other ISP is going to be involved. And let's use this speed test to recall what we learned earlier in this chapter about cable access networks. Packets travel from my home up through my local cable access network to a cable head-end device, which is connected to a Comcast router, which will forward my packets through the Comcast network to the server that I'm connecting to to run the speed test. Now, to run the speed test, I'm going to go to speedtest.net, which will give me the IP address of a speed test server. In this case, I'm going to connect to this Comcast speed test server in Boston, about 100 kilometers east of here. Then I'll start the speed test. My browser will connect to that speed test server and try to first download data as fast as possible and then upload data as fast as possible. Let's try it out. You can see that I'll be connecting to a Comcast speed test server in Boston and I'll press go and we're off. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.
<laughs> it looks like we peaked out at just over 300 megabits per second. Not bad at all. Next, speed test is going to upload, that is to say, send data to the Comcast speed test server as fast as possible. Wow, a lot slower. Well, that was really interesting to see the great difference between the download speeds, 300 megabits per second versus the upload speeds, only 17 megabits per second on my access network. It's a factor of 20 difference. And we learned earlier that the reason for that is that me, my neighbors, were primarily consumers of data. That is, we download data, we download videos to watch, rather than producers of data. And we've seen here numerically how Comcast has engineered my access network to reflect that. Well, there's one more thing I'd like to do. I'd like to try out from my mobile phone. I want to run speed test and take a look at what are the upload rates, what are the download rates, again, to a Comcast server. But this time, going through my mobile phone, through the Verizon wireless network, and then eventually to the Comcast network. Let's try it out. Here's the mobile speed test scenario. I'm going to run speed tests from my iPhone, which is attached to Verizon's wireless access network. So my speed test packets headed again to a Comcast server in Boston will need to be forwarded between Verizon's network and Comcast's network. It turns out that there's only one intermediate network known as Alter.net sitting on my path between Verizon and Comcast. So let's try out speed test on my iPhone. Okay, here we go. Wow, look at that. Only two megabits per second download speed. As it turns out, on an iPhone, I can't actually run an upload test. Maybe I need to get the app to do that. So it's really interesting to see that on my mobile access network, I'm only getting a couple megabits per second download speed, as opposed to more than 300 megabits per second on my wired Comcast cable network download. Well, that wraps up our supplementary discussion of who uses the internet. In the next supplementary video, we want to take a look at the issue of who controls the internet. I think you'll find that interesting.